So as with uh, most lecturers you're getting now, this is my last lecture to, of the year to you. Um, we are going to cover two of the five senses today, smell and taste. Um, they're put together largely uh, because anatomically they're close together. There is some overlap, so it is true that when you taste stuff, that smell gets detected too, and so that's a large detection of taste. So if you um, inhale fumes and your uh, sense of taste goes down, your sense of, or sorry, your sense of smell goes down, your sense of taste will go down too, and there's clinical manifestations to that, people losing weight because they can't eat. We'll get into all that. All right, uh, there's online notes like normal. Everything you need to know is on the slide deck. Um, I'm going to leave the objectives uh, for you to read. They're pretty evenly split. Um, uh, I use a few more slides to go over the different types of uh, taste receptors, but they're not, um, not that detailed. So if I were you, I would study and have made this table. So I just made the table. So this will make more sense later, but as we talk about the tastes, there's three, three main taste cells, cell type one, type two, and type three. You really only have to know this one through five, okay? And that covers salty, sweet, umami, bitter, and sour taste. Fat, cold, and hot are not currently thought of as tastes. Um, I think they will in 20 years. Fat's getting even more that way. Um, they're not worked out as well. But the take home is that the salty uh, taste has its own cell, a type one cell. The sweet umami and bitter taste are all type two, and each cell is one of those based on the GPCR dimer that it presents, okay? And I'm gonna go through all of this. Um, and then type three is detected by sour, and the mechanism with which that's uh, detected has actually been a little hard to tease out, and I'll talk about why. And so um, after the lecture, look at this slide, see if it makes more sense. You'll see some similarities, right? So in the type two cells, the depolarization happens through increased calcium, and they end up releasing ATP, which causes signal transduction. Um, type three also causes increased calcium, but there the signal transduction is a lot like a neuron. It releases serotonin, okay? In addition, it actually also releases, it's been found as it releases serotonin, it releases about a third as much neuroprenephrine sometimes. And so that again has clinical manifestations if you're taking drugs that affect those. Okay, and so you'll see these proteins named TRP somethings. The TRP stands for transient receptor potential, and then it will be M, P, or V. Those letters are based off compounds that were initially found to bind these receptors. So the vanilla compound, vanilloid, is the V one. Interestingly, that one, even though it binds a receptor, is actually a, a kind of spicy receptor. So caspasin binds that one. Okay. So the cover slide has type one, two, and three all together, and they do interact, but it kind of got hard to see, so I just made simplified sides, but you can go back and look at the cover slide, and then I have a very ugly simplified version later. So type one cells are termed um, glial-like in that they're numerous and they interact with the other cells, okay? So they have an ENAC channel. Uh, I think you guys can see the whole slide, right? I'm fading stuff in, but so ENAC, the NA stands for sodium, Right? And so sodium can flow through that. And so type one is detecting salt. What is salt in boring biochemistry talk? Sodium chloride, right. The white stuff on your countertop is sodium chloride. And so that as soon as you put it in water, it dissociates. And so the sodium ion can go through ENAC. Now, we don't really know how that signal is transduced. We know that this cell, the type one cell, is non-excitatory. So it does not send the signal. But what it does do is it interacts with other cells, and we know if you block that ENAC, you lose that sense of taste, or a sense of salt. It also releases ectoATPases. That's gonna become important, because remember I told you the type two cells released ATP as their signal? Well, this can degrade the ATP signal. So um, the take home would be if you think of you're eating something sweet, and I'm gonna show you in a second the type two cells detecting that. If you then eat something salty, not only will this cell somehow detect the salt, but it will release ectoATPases and kind of degrade the sweet taste. And so it kind of masks it a little bit. This talk used to be a um, podcast, so feel free to ask questions as we go, although students have kept asking enough questions that it's pretty much 
a lecture length now, but honestly, uh, dynamically ask what you want. Okay, so the type two cells um, um, have the GPCRs out here where they can bind taste tastins, okay? And they're a combination, they dimerize these T1Rs and T2Rs. And I showed you somewhere else, and I'll show you again, the combination that causes the different flavors. But whenever a tastin binds it, it releases a calcium store in the cell. That calcium activates this TRPM5 channel, which brings in more calcium. And that causes the uh, opening of panexin and ATP throws, flows out through panexin. Now, does anyone remember a protein I talked about in uh, my extracellular matrix lecture long ago in foundations about a protein that rhymed with panexin? Connexin, right. And what, what was it in? What, what type of interactions? Cell to cell, yes. A certain type of cell to cell? Gap junctions, right, and so someone else said something, you were thinking voltage, right, so you're passing. So basically, the connexin opened a pore between two cells and cytoplasm could flow between and so you could um, have depolarization flow through. Panexin is basically half of connexin. So you're opening a pore, but to the outside, okay? And so ATP flows through that. <clears throat> um, you don't have to know about the cold and hot, just know they work differently, and cold isn't the temperature cold, it's these things that we refer to as cold, like menthol, peppermint, and the hot is things like pepper, caspasin. Um, <laughs> yesterday, I was having some ramen noodle for my kid, and I put the hot peppers on, but the top fell off. So half the thing went into my soup, but I really wanted it. So I ate it anyway. <laughs> That's the most hot pepper I've ever had in my life. Okay. So type three um, has not, it, it's interesting. A lot of things have been found out about it and they overlap. How are we detecting sour? So sour is this acid taste, right? The reason this is a little hard is because if you have something outside the cell that's, let's say, negatively charged, when the pH drops, when it becomes acidic, there's a lot of hydrogen ions. So what happens to that negatively charged thing? From my pH lecture, I think my first lecture I gave you. What happens to the negative charge when there's a lot of positive charge? It doesn't go boom, it's not like an explosion in your cell, but it becomes associated. The hydrogen goes there. So that molecule becomes uncharged and then it can pass through the membrane potentially. So one way to detect acid is to uncharge negative compounds and have them pass through the membrane and then dissociate the hydrogen ion again inside the cell. And that probably happens, we've also found channels that specifically or also pump hydrogen ions. So ENAC, again, sodium is an Na plus charge, and a version of ENAC can allow hydrogen to go through. There's more specifically this PKD2L pore that allows hydrogen in, and just this year, this channel that was already known, OTOP1, also allows hydrogen uh, in. It's interesting, OTOP1 is actually in the ear and is what allows us to feel gravity. It's involved with the um, calcium balls rolling around in your ear. Okay, so um, you're probably not gonna be tested on those on the boards, right? You could have a rare genetic defect in one of those, but unlikely. Take home is hydrogen gets in. What happens in type three cells? One, it blocks the potassium channel, so potassium's not flowing out, and that hydrogen also opens the calcium channel. So you get this calcium in, and that causes serotonin release, and this can be thought of very much like a neuron, right? You have this gustatory nerve sitting right there, it releases serotonin, there's serotonin receptors, boom, you've detected sour. Any questions about type one, two, or three? Yeah. So what happens when you eat those pills that turn off these receptors? Um, like uh, miracle fruit pills? Yeah, so I have a FYI slide at the end about that. Who, show of hands here, who has not heard of miracle fruit? Okay, a few people. So there's this fruit and they've purified the compound and you can buy it now very cheaply online. I think I even have a link to Amazon where you can buy it. And basically it binds your sour receptors without triggering them, okay? So it's a competitive inhibitor. And so if you eat that and then you take a bite of lemon, the lemon doesn't taste sour at all. 
because it, lemon has a little bit of sugar and you're not tasting any of the sour. And so there's whole industries that have grown up around this miracle fruit. There are restaurants that have meals, planned meals, and you come in and you eat a little and then you eat this pill and then you eat something else and you detect the taste and differences. Okay. So here's the summary of this combination. Um, I've kind of circled and barred the things I want you to know. So the uh, sweet taste is T1R3 coupled with T1R2, that dimer. The umami flavor is again T1R3, but dimerized with T1R1. Uh, can someone tell me what the umami flavor is? Describe that. What? Savory, yes, savory is kind of the main synonym used for that. And so a lot of people associate this with meat. So glutamate is the poster child for umami favor. In particular, people talk about monosodium glutamate, MSG. Interestingly, what happens when you eat monosodium glutamate? It dissociates instantly, so you're detecting both the sodium and the glutamate. So that taste of MSG is actually a combination of the salt and the umami. Um, the bitter taste is a combination of a dimer of two T2Rs, and there's a, uh, there's a bunch of T2Rs, 30. The ENAC channels for sodium, and then again, I told you the sour is a little more complicated. This one's just talking about the PKD2L1. So look at these green bars with me for a second. Um, so I already talked about L-glutamate being umami. There's um, amino acids, protein is uh, savory. For sugars, all the normal sugars, we're gonna talk about artificial sweeteners a bit. So they're hitting these sweet receptors too. D amino acid glycine, and then there's sweet proteins. These become important for um, diabetics. So there are proteins that bind the sweet receptors and taste sweet. But a ramification, can anyone think of um, if you're buying that to cook with, what a ramification might be that it's a protein? Going back to my enzyme lecture, what's the difference between proteins and catalysts? Catalysts are small, rigid proteins. Proteins are complex and they're fragile. So if you cook them, they unravel. And then there's 3D structure changes, and then they don't bind the sweet thing. So you can't use these in anything that has high temperature cooking, or you won't get that sweet effect. And people could uh, try to compensate with more food or something if you're not, you know, I'll get into all that. There's an interesting story there. Okay. So here's my ugly, this is actually not the ugliest rendition. This is a second rendition of a, a summary, putting them all together. So type two can swine, combine sweet umami or bitter. Note that even though I showed it as one thing here, each cell is either sweet, either umami, or e either bitter. So each cell has one type of dimer it's expressing, right? Uh, and they signal through ATP. The type three cells detect sour. They signal through serotonin. And the type one cells um, kind of modify the type two and can modify the signal. So here's a picture of uh, how they all look together. So these one, two, and three cells are together into a taste bud. And so you have this little taste bud pore. The brown ones are the type ones, the glial-like. We have a lot of them. The type two are the sweet, bitter umami. And the type three are sour. Now, I'd point out a lot of people kind of think of this wrong anatomically. You see these bumps that we have on our tongue? That is not a taste bud. That is a gigantic structure. If you zoom in on one of those bumps here, if you go down into a crevice, you see a bunch of taste buds here, okay? And so there's different, there's um, four main types of structures that house these taste buds. Um, the Fafile papillae is unique in that it's, uh, narrow, tall, and does not detect taste. It just detects texture, okay? It's kind of, just think about it kind of getting hit and feeling what you're eating. The other ones are roughly split a third, and the fungiform papillae um, has been found. There are people that are super tasters, so they can detect very small amounts of taste and kind of more taste. They have an increase in um, basically the number of um, fungiform on their tongue and hence an increase in taste buds. Okay, so we are going to uh, talk about Sjogren's syndrome, which you just heard about in the last lecture. Luckily, when we talk about taste and smell, a lot of the terms are scientific and kind of just make sense. You don't have to memorize them. You'll, you should read them and they should make sense, right? So agesia, a meaning not, is the loss of sense of taste. Hypogesia, hypo meaning low, is a decreased sense of taste. 
and dyskesia is a distorted sense of taste, okay? And you'll see one of the things that you can try for hypogesia is zinc supplements, because it turns out that zinc's inv involved in a lot of this. We have zinc fingers that bind um, uh, DNA, and so it's not a single target, but there's actually a fair amount of zinc deficiency. Up to a third of US people can be zinc deficient. So it's an easy, pretty harmless thing to, to try if a patient comes in and has recent hypogesia. Okay, so for agesia, Sjogren's syndrome is clearly the most board testable. How can you have agesia? Agesia is I've lost a sense of taste, and I just talked about these three cells and different dimers, and I'm saying none of them work. The only way that all of that's affected, one way could be like a head trauma, right? So you're getting the signal, but you're not processing it correctly. But for Sjogren's syndrome, the way it's working is all of that machinery I talk about could work, but you don't have the saliva. You don't have the mucus that the GPCR needs to be in, so the taste can't come in. We're all, we've evolved for everything to work in an aqueous environment. So agesia is, um, or sorry, Sjogren's syndrome is an autoimmune disorder. So as you've heard from your immunology le lectures, women are much more prone to get autoimmune diseases, so they're 15 to one more likely to have Sjogren's syndrome. Sorry. Antibiotics and antifungals cause it, and yet again, epigenetics and age can cause it. So when you're looking at people that are 70 years versus 40 years, the 70 year olds are eight times more likely to have Sjogren's syndrome. Um, uh, and along with the total lack of taste, they can just have a metallic taste in their mouth. There's two types of Sjogren's syndrome, primary PSS Sjogren's syndrome and secondary Sjogren's syndrome. If people come into the clinic with like a very big problem of dry eyes, this is not an annual checkup and like, oh, the pollen's affecting my eyes. But if they're coming in and they're super red eyes, 0.5% of the time they have primary Sjogren's syndrome and 10% of the time they have secondary Sjogren's syndrome. Secondary is caused by rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Primary is caused by this, these autoantibodies, and there's multiples of them, but 60% of people with primary Sjogren's syndrome have anti-Rho and anti-La uh, antibodies. And those are involved uh, in a lot of things, so you don't really need to know it. They go into the DNA, they are in the cytoplasm, they interact with each other, but it's board testable, it's in first aid. Know those two are related to Sjogren's syndrome. So you test for those, and if they're positive for them, they have primary Sjogren's syndrome. Um, so what can you do to treat this? You can try to give something to increase sweat, tear, saliva. You can also try to tamp down the immune system, B-cell depletion therapy. And again, you can try zinc supplements. Zinc supplements are more for hypogesia, uh, general loss of taste. All right, any questions about that? We're gonna move on to artificial sweeteners. Okay, I'd put this in like the top 10 things students ask me about because they're all trying to be healthy and eating this and hearing it cause cancer and blah, blah, blah. So here's the current understanding, as I understand it, of artificial sweeteners. So um, I'm gonna go into a bit of kind of epidemiology here. So if you look over time, a higher percentage of the US population has been consuming um, artificial sweeteners in this orange line, right? At the same time, uh, the proportion of Americans has been becoming uh, fatter with a higher BMI, right, red line. And we're using more and more sweeteners now, uh, kind of exponentially looking here in the purple line, okay? So first of all, this is all correlation, right? It could be, yes, sweeteners are good. If instead of having a big gulp of Coke, if you have a big gulp of Diet Coke, it's less calories, that's good. But maybe when you have the big, dup, big gulp of Diet Coke, do they, they still sell big gulps, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, maybe you have an extra Big Mac, and so you're actually getting more calories, right? This is all correlation. So um, here's two interesting things. If you look at studies that look at artificial sweeteners versus control, so think of this as putting someone in a room and one group gets a big gulp of Coke, one, I'm not getting paid disclaimer by Coca-Cola, and one group gets a Diet Coke, okay? And then they are on a treadmill doing the same sort of exercise. If you, each line's a study and the black diamond is kind of the average. If you look at verse control, their BMI is down, not amazing, but down a little. And if you look at their weight, their weight is down a little. And that's all kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, they're not getting calories, it's good. If you look at it versus a cohort, so this is not in the controlled setting. This is, okay, how many Diet Cokes do you drink? And then what happens? It's the opposite effect. People's BMI goes up with NNS, non-nutritional sweeteners. Those are artificial sweeteners. People's weight goes up with uh, artificial sweeteners. And type 2 diabetes goes up with 
artificial sweeteners. So how can you explain that discrepancy? Any guess is good. There's, uh, you know, people are talking about this. It's not like there's a total right and wrong answer. Yeah. Isn't it your body is confused because it's sensing that you're getting something sweet, but then there's no calories, so you're going to hold on to weight more? So. Yeah. Did I already lecture on this in carbohydrates? I don't think I gave you this, right? That answer is amazingly accurate. <laughs> Very good. So that, there is new data to suggest, yes, that is likely part of it. Um, and again, it could be it, likely in the outside world, you are, so there's two things. There's one, what you said, which I think is even more true than you know right now. And also, you compensate, you eat more, right? You want, you, you, you tasted sweet, but you didn't get the sweet, and then you overdo it later. Yeah. Um, in the cohort study, were they also using treadmills like in the control study? Yeah, so these are a bunch of studies. So generally, no. Yeah, okay. Some of those may be surveys, right? Okay, so I almost, this is the first time I'm giving this data. I almost took it out because it's complicated and I tried to winnow down this research into kind of one or two slides. So I'm gonna see a show of hands if this makes sense afterwards because I think this is really cool. They did a study where they gave maltodextrin. So that has calories, but it does not have taste to us, okay? And then they also gave sucralose, which has taste, but does not have calories. And then they basically gave it where they lined up, where you, gave, you got the same amount of sweet from sucralose as calories from maltodextrin, and where you got the differing amounts. And the take home is, when it lines up, our body responds more. When it doesn't line up, all our responses are tamped down, and they looked at a bunch of different responses, okay? So here we're looking at two experiments, giving 75 kilocalories of sucralose, 112, 150, 150. So let's start with the first one. They're doing an fMRI when they give 75 kilocalories of sucralose. And with these other bars, this is how much maltodextrin they gave. So the fMRI has the most effect when the sweet taste matches the calorie taste. Does that make sense? And it actually goes down in both directions when it's off, okay? Then they looked at uh, a change in resting energy expenditure. This is the big thing of kind of about, uh, one of the big things about losing weight. So if I had to boil it down to like what I tell my seven-year-old, well, in a healthy manner, is that basically it's calories in. By far, we can consume way more cal And again, I'm talking about all about reducing obesity. You can consume way more calories than it's easy to burn off. But then also after that, a secondary thing is what's your resting metabolic rate? If you're running a lot, clearly that helps. Um, so it's in that order. Okay, so when you look at the resting, ener energy, uh, resting energy, um, again, it's increased more when the sweet taste matches the calorie taste compared to when it does not. Even though over here at 150, you're actually getting more calories, but you're not getting as much sweetness, okay? So then experiment two, this, they all kind of follow the trend, 112, Again, you have the most signal for resting energy expenditure when they match up, and it's lower when they don't match up. And then when you go to the high extreme of 100, or sorry, this is uh, looking at blood glucose. Again, the better, the higher blood glucose change is when they match up than when they don't match up. Again, notice at 150, you're actually getting more calories, but you're not having as much of a blood glucose change because you didn't have the sweet signal. And then at 150 kilocalories, the resting energy expenditure, again, was the most when the taste and calories matched up compared to going down. The show of hands, did that make sense to people? Okay, not so much. Okay, so there's a few ways this happens. One of the take homes that I'll follow through with on the next slide is those receptors we have that detect sweet, those aren't just in our mouth. We've now found they're in our gut. So in our gut, we're also detecting sweet, and our metabolism is changing based on that. Okay? Yeah. So basically what you mean is that when you have these artificial sweeteners that have maybe more calories, yeah. but that your body won't release the right amount of, like won't have the proper blood sugar, so then your body doesn't know how much it's actually taking in. So it's less. Yeah, it, your body basically doesn't know. So, so let me 
re-say what you said a few times. First of all, when you have artificial sweeteners, you're having no calories or very low calories. So you're having the signal that you have calories from the sweetness, but you actually don't have them. And so um, if you are eating some calories with a Diet Coke, it's again off, and your, your body's not responding in all, correctly in all these ways. Your resting energy expenditure isn't responding as much. Your blood glucose isn't responding much. And to, mo to me, the most interesting, the fMRI, because that is the one that you're probably not feeling um, satiety. You're not feeling full as much as you should, and that would reduce you eating more, OK? Um, you don't need to worry about this. The take home here is they looked at the difference and uh, uh, zero to 150 was bad. The red line, um, it's when does taste and calories not match up. It's kind of the same information. Just if you didn't get the first one, that's probably too confusing. Okay, so here are the main artificial sweeteners. Aspartame, which is in NutraSweet or Equal. Sucralose, which is in Splenda. Saccharin, which is in Sweet and Low. Um, Acylfame K or ACE K, which is in Equal also. It's a combo. Neotame, which you've probably, has anyone heard of Neotame, show of hands? Okay, and then uh, erythriol, uh, which is in Truvia. And so uh, the take homes I would want you to get from here are, again, you never have to know any structures for any of my lectures. I'm just giving them to make sense. You can see how Neotame is a lot like aspartame, right? So first of all, very board testable. What is aspartame? It's basically two amino acids. It's this green aspartate and then phenylalanine. And then it also gets degraded into those two plus methanol. Methanol, everyone's like, oh no, you're gonna get blind, right? If you brew hooch, you make methanol instead of ethanol and you can get blind. Aspartame creates very little methanol because you don't have a lot of it. Fruit has methanol, so it's not that big an issue. But uh, people with PKU cannot have aspartame because it has the phenylalanine, right? You guys all know that. So neotame, very much like that, but it has this um, uh, uh, fatty chain on it, which basically prevents it from being metabolized in the same way. So people with PKU can have neotame, OK? So which of these are metabolized quickly? I was going to quiz you, but I'm just going to kind of go through it. So aspartame, um, that's kind of my artificial sweetener of choice if I'm going to have one, right? I shouldn't, but I have them. And the reason is, is because I know it gets broken down into amino acids, which can't be that bad for you. We have them, right? Um, uh, Splenda is very much like sugar up here. It's just um, uh, a chlorinated version, so it gets metabolized. Saccharin and um, ACE-K are very different. They're not metabolized well, and so I'm showing you things in red that are bad. I'll show you potentially bad and why. Neotame, I have a little why, because if, if you look up on up-to-date, or it'll say it gets metabolized, but it gets partially metabolized. It doesn't get metabolized in an important way, and it still binds the sweet receptor for a long, long time, and that becomes important, okay? And then Truvia, also not metabolized. So this yes should be probably uh, red. So what's heat stable? Basically, aspartame's the only one that's not. So if you're going to brew tea all day, the aspartame can lose uh, sweetness. Um, Neotame is labeled as moderately, but really it's pretty heat stable. You can use it. And then because of that stability and because we have these receptors um, and because we have a microbiome, some of these have been found to hurt our microbiome. So aspartame does not because it's degraded in its amino acids. Sucralose has been found to it. Saccharin, no. These are little ends. ACE-K, no, because maybe they do, but not definitively at all. Neotame, I would put more on the yes side. Um, I'm showing you here where some of them are. And then these last ones show the accepted daily intake, the ADI, and the sweetness multiplier. And so you'll see right away that aspartame, its sweetness multiplier is 200. So one gram of that is equal to 200 grams of sugar. But if you look at neotame, which is very similar in structure, it's 10,000 times, OK? So neotame. You can't even buy in grocery stores because you, you don't add little enough to sweeten your stuff. It's used in processed foods. And it, I'll show you, I think, in the next slide, if I haven't already. Yeah, these are all grass. These are all labeled generally recognized as safe. Um, and so I'm showing you things now that like this might hurt our gut biome. Um, they're not metabolized quickly. Neotame, it looks like, is not always labeled on things, right? We don't have access, and it's just in some stuff. And I've seen stuff that hasn't. Maybe that's wrong that they're not labeling it, but it hasn't been listed there. 
Okay, and there's a link to a filled out version there. Whoops. All right, we're gonna move on to smell. Any questions about taste? Yeah. You know where like stevia would fit into that? I thought I had that. Uh, stevia, I think, is made from true, uh, is, isn't a version of Truvia? I don't know that, that trait, Jamie. You'll have to look it up. I'm pretty sure, what? Where do I have stevia? I don't see it. Yes, yes. Oh, actually, <laughs> last summer I had stevia. You can buy that plant. It look, it's like an herb, and you take it off, and it tastes, it tastes like artificial sweet. I mean, it tastes like sugar. Yeah, so it's easy to put in any drink, mojitos, whatever you want. All right, for example. So um, let's go on to smell. So here you have um, these odorants coming in, um, which are amazingly diverse, right? Honestly, like clearly sight is our most important sense, well, arguably, but smell was very important in an evolutionary sense. I'll talk about that. But so it's very hard. Light is always the same. There's a wavelength to detect. We've got it down. Odorants are like you know a million different compounds. How do we detect them? Um, Basically, we invest a lot of our genome to do it. All right, so I like this quote, the olfactory epithelium. This has been called the place in our body where the nervous system is closest to the world. So you have neurons that at the end of them have receptors to buy, bind odorants. And as soon as the odorant binds, there's an action potential that goes straight to your brain, okay? And so um, that's great because you can detect the outside world, but your nerve is exposed to the outside world, and so it dies. And so there's a rapid turnover of these cells, and that can cause a loss of sense of smell, OK? So this whole red area here is about four quarters by four quarters. So it's a large surface area that you can have receptors. And then that is kind of um, funneled in, uh, through bone to the olfactory bulb, which is the surface area of a quarter of a quarter. OK, so it's all concentrated kind of for processing. Again. The names are very uh, uh, intuitive. Anosmia, no odor detection. Hypoosmia, decreased odor detection. Hyperosmia, increased um, odor detection. So pregnant women are a good example. They actually do have that. Dysosmia, distorted sense of smell. Tropoosmia, distorted quality. And phantosmia, when you think you can smell something that's not really there. Okay, all those things exist. All right, so now we're zooming into that top part, okay? And so you have 500 genes that can detect 10,000 odors. These are uh, GPCR uh, receptors. And there's basically, again, one gene per cell, OK? And so I'll take you through the odorant binds here and goes up and is processed. Uh, quick recap, people, I mean, our sense of smell, since we have so many genes, is very unique. People are trying to develop uh, things that you could smell that would identify you as a person, just like a thumbprint would. We've evolved to uh, prefer people that are smelled differently because if we mate with them, our child is more likely to not have a genetic problem because we're mixing the gene pool. Um, and when I'm, I've mentioned uh, Iceland to you before, they're a unique country that's very wealthy and has sequenced a lot of its people. Um, uh, so when they sequenced them, they found what's been, what, what have we been evolving recently? And we've been losing the sense of smell. That is one of the top things we've lost. We don't need it. And so it's just kind of those, those we, we haven't been selected for when those genes go away. And the things that have gone up are um, we're social and we need to uh, uh, have facial recognition uh, with each other and we're complex. Embryogenesis has gone up, FYI, not on the boards. OK, so signal transduction, here's that. Um, olfactory neuron coming down, and you have these GPCRs and odorant binds. It causes C-AMP to activate a channel, so calcium and sodium come in. That causes a chloride, chloride ion to be activated, which causes depolarization. And here's the minutia of the GPCR you've seen before. The take home here is these things are exposed to the world, these little GPCRs, and so they die every 50 days or so. So if someone comes in and, you know, they were huffing something or they're exposed or they lost their sense of smell and it's fairly recent, a reasonable course of action is a wait and see, okay? Be like, okay, um, 
you know, you can give them guidance in the midterm. In the midterm, so lack of sense of smell can actually be a significant issue for mainly select populations. So, like elder elder people that are not in assisted living, if they can't detect that meat has gone bad, they can, you know, that can be a problem for them. All right, so the odorant comes in, it goes through bone, the crib reform plate, and so here I'm showing green. Um, neurons come together in this olfactory glomerulus, so you're kind of combining the signal of this odorant, okay? And now you have three different odorants, um, blue, red, and green, and they go through mitral cells, and then I'm zooming in on the mitral cells. In between the mitral cells, there's granular cells that can do crosstalk, and so they can inhibit by using GABA or activate by using glutamate. And the, the way this happens, it's basically signal processing. It's you are always detecting 500 smells, but our brain can't enumerate all those different possibilities, so you kind of funnel out the low-level noise, right? If something's 1% of your smell and there's this 99%, you're gonna downgrade the 1% and be like, focus on this predator near me or whatever you're smelling, okay? All right, so what causes that total lack of smell? Again, we have a bunch of genes, so it has to be kind of all-encompassing, right? It's not a point mutation. A point mutation in one gene would just make one receptor not work. A head trauma can cause it where you're not processing the signal. Tumors, likewise. Zinc deficiency, again, can cause it. Um, nasal congestants, uh, decongestants can cause it. Tra upper respiratory tract infections. I'll show you some data that um, Loss of smell is one of the first things to go in dementia. Um, and uh, uh, as people get older, uh, with their lack of appetite. Okay, so how do we detect all these smells? There's something called molecular receptive range. And the take home there is that one receptor can bind a class of molecules, okay? So this is one receptor, and the higher the bar, the more it's detecting it. And these are how the compounds are changing. So on this axis, on the left, we're adding carbons on the left side, one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon. On this uh, other axis on the right, we're adding carbons on the right, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons. So it looks like this receptor binds things well that have five carbons on the right and one or two carbons on the left of an ester, okay? So the point there being when someone loses a sense of cinnamon smell, um, they might lose a sense of things that are like chemically like cinnamon, okay? So how sensitive are these and what can we actually smell? So let's start at the top here. Sorry, I meant to fade this in. So the take home here is that our intensity discrimination is poor for smell and taste. So what do I mean by that? If you are tasting a certain amount of sugar um, and you want to uh, taste more sugar, <laughs> you need to go up 30% to detect that there was more. That's not very accurate at all, okay? Not very precise. The sensitivity is very good for smell and kind of in the middle for taste. So how am I describing those? So let's name things that you've heard before. So carbon dioxide, can we smell it? No. Uh, our odor detection for carbon dioxide is 74,000 parts per million. That's how you measure gas, right? So how many of those are in a million molecules in the gas? Well, where, uh, with climate change, you might have heard that we passed 400 parts per million, so we're at like 415 as of yesterday. So we can't smell it. Unfortunately, we die at 50,000 parts per million. It would have been nice if we evolved to smell it before we died, you know, if our head was in a bag or something, but we're never realistically going to get that high. Maybe in a bag, but okay. Anyway, so as you go down, as things become more and more deleterious to us, our sensitivity increases. Gasoline, you get that drop of gasoline on your sleeve and you can smell it all day. Our threshold there is 0.3 parts per million. Kerosene, acetic acid, hydrogen sulfide is 0.0005 parts per million, okay? Now, I'm gonna compare that to taste, and since taste is in micromoles per liter, I just did a conversion here so you can see. So for taste, what about glucose? Glucose, our threshold is 80,000 micromoles per liter. Now that might seem odd at first because glucose is very important to us and this means we cannot taste it well. But we do not want to have a drop of a Big Mac, you know, juice and be like, ugh, I'm done, 
we got enough, or I don't know, I guess it would be uh, bread, right, a little piece of bread. You need a lot of it in volume. So you do, your, your detection of that is down, so your body wants more, okay? Same with sucrose. MSG is about 10,000. Sodium chloride becomes um, higher sensitivity, so we don't t put, you know, volume-wise that much salt in our body. We don't need that much 2,000. Then you get to the bad things, Hy hydrochloric acid, 100 micromoles per liter. And then you get down to strychnine. If you ever saw, like, old Bond films, this was used as a poison, 1.6 micromoles per liter. So the smell threshold you see is orders of magnitude or can be orders of magnitude more sensitive than taste threshold, okay? Uh, and again, one, I used to have an action figure here. I think I mentioned this in my pH lecture. Uh, one of the things that I don't think people do a lot is the Western diet, we have way too much sodium. So one of the ways, the biohacks you can do for your patients is you can mix sodium salt and potassium salt. And it, once you get to about a one-to-one -one ratio is usually where people can't tell the difference when you go beyond that. If you have like 80% potassium chloride, and 20% sodium, people can tell the difference. So potassium chloride is dash salt, that's the name brand, and it tastes a little different, not as good. But at a one-to-one -one ratio in you know, Casa de Arbor, we get less sodium using that mix. Okay. I will say the other Dr. Arbor likes her Norma Morton salt, which is iodine uh, fortified, which there is a deficiency in, so make sure you get your iodine. Okay, so this is a big FYI slide, but um, there are ways to actually use this information. So there's this Pennsylvania small identification test, UPSIT, and it's a scratch and sniff test. It's in 30 languages, and over a million people have used it, and it's very specific for um, detecting dementia early on. So it has 90% specificity and 85% sensitivity, and so mild cognitive impairment that can go on to become Alzheimer's disease could be detected with this. The reason I don't think this is really used more is, what do you do with this? We still don't have a drug for Alzheimer's, right? So um, you tell them, like always, exercise more, eat healthy. So um, have, have I mentioned the peanut butter test to you? No? Okay, so this was maybe five years ago. Someone discovered that if you take like a teaspoon of peanut butter and put it close to the nostril, people with um, Alzheimer's will not be able to smell that something like five or six years before they have a phenotype, before they have cognitive decline, okay? Again, what do you do with that? I don't know. I thought like in a hospital you could have like one side of the hallway that has peanut butter and then like facial recognition to see who doesn't look up and smell it or something. But again, you know, what do you do? We need a drug for it. All right. I think that's it. Uh, let me know. This poll's open. Let me know how the lecture was and any questions for the class or you can come on up. All right. Come up if you have questions. Oh, and here are, here's the uh, miracle fruit. Oh, and then another FYI. Evidently, your um, face has very soft skin that's unique to other parts of the body. So this person, I think, was in a car accident and had a, a nose grafted onto their face and left on their forehead to heal before they cut it and pivoted it down so it had the same structure as their face. 